evening and welcome to the All Things Fulfilled broadcast. Presented to you each week from 7.30 until 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 6.30 to 7 p.m. Central Time. Right here on the Now Network. I am William Bell and in just a moment we're going to get underway with the study. Before we do, let me make a few announcements. First of all, we'd like to encourage you to visit our YouTube page. Uh, we have a channel there with over 750 videos and counting. Uh, we upload videos just about every single week, sometimes uh, a couple of times a week, so that you always have plenty of fresh content to watch when you visit the channel. In addition, we encourage you to visit our website, which is at All Things Fulfill, and uh, we appreciate you taking the time to do that as well. Uh, we have a mobile app, which is All Things Fulfill. There is no charge for it. It's absolutely free. We encourage you to download that as well. And today, we're going to be discussing a subject from Matthew 24 and comparing it with Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. Um, the reason for this and the aim of this study is to show that the judgment mentioned in Acts 17, verses 30 and 31 fulfills the requirements of Matthew 24 and verse 14 and vice versa. In other words, those two passages are parallel. They deal with the very same subject and they are fulfilled at the same time. Now, it is commonly believed that Acts 17, 30 and 31 is a discussion of a future judgment and return of Christ. In other words, that this text is talking about a coming of the Lord sometime in our future. On the other hand, it is widely accepted that Matthew 24 refers to a judgment which came upon Jerusalem in 70 AD in the first century when the temple was destroyed. And of course, that's a view that I hold to. Uh, but the question is, are these two separate judgments or are they the same judgment? Do they refer to the same uh, event and time? Now, we must be fair in saying that some believe that Matthew 24, 14 refers to a yet future judgment. In other words, they do not understand the context of Matthew 24 to have been fulfilled in 70 AD with the destruction of the temple and the city of Jerusalem. So they project it out to a time in our future, and uh, we must be fair at least in letting you know that that is the view of some. However, the evidence strongly favors a preterite or a past fulfillment of the text, and our approach will be to examine the elements in both texts and comment on them and then draw the conclusions that show why we believe that both of these passages refer to a time in the first century. So let's go ahead and get into the uh, lesson. In Matthew 24, 14, uh, we have a part of the response to the disciples' question regarding the prophecy of the temple's destruction. And when we look at that, what we're seeing is Jesus' message to the Jews regarding their fate. Now, this message begins as early as Matthew 23 uh, in terms of speaking of the woes that would come upon the uh, city. And so Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. This is Matthew 23 and verse 29. Because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. And say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are the sons of the prophets or sons of those who murdered the prophets. Matthew 23, verse 31. And then verse 32 says, fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Now, Jesus is telling them, look, this is the behavior that your father started. You continue to do the work that your father started because you have the same uh, hearts that they do. Uh, you have the same evil intentions that they do. And so uh, this is what he's telling them. So in verse 20, 33, he says, serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you. So here's Christ talking to the audience of the Pharisees that are before him. And he says, therefore, indeed, I send you wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. And some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, 
son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Now, once he makes that statement, he tells us that all of this would take place in that generation because he says, assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation, Matthew 20, 36. And then he identifies the people that he's talking to when he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the Lord told them that all of those things, that judgment, that uh, vengeance, that wrath was going to come upon the generation of Israel living in that time when he was on earth. And he says it would not pass away. And thus all of it will come upon that generation until, um, uh, or rather the generation wouldn't pass until all those things came upon them. Now, after he finishes that conversation, uh, the Bible says that Jesus went out, he departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to him to show him the buildings of the temple. Why? Because he had just made the declaration, he had just made the statement that the temple was going to be destroyed. Their house would be left to them desolate. There was going to be an invasion of the Roman armies, which is historically documented, that this temple and the city would be destroyed. So they ask him the question after they show him the buildings of the temple, saying in Matthew 24 and verse 2, And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, a lot of people are under the impression that the text says, when will be the end of the world? Maybe because of an overmuch influence of reading the King James Version. But if you look in the original text, look at the language of the Greek. It actually says the completion or the consummation of the age. So they weren't looking for the end of a physical world. They were asking about the end of the age in which they lived, and that would be the age of Moses. Now, in response to the question, what we read in Matthew chapter 24, actually all the way through to chapter 25, to the end of that chapter, is Jesus' response to the question. And so we are not to pick and choose some things out of the text or the context of Matthew 24 and say this relates to Jesus' discussion about the fall of the temple, but this part does not. No, all of this was one narrative, one answer that he gave all the way to the end of Matthew 25, showing that the continuity of this context cannot be broken. But let's go ahead and look at uh, something that he said in the context that's uh, relevant to the point that we're making in comparison, uh, comparing Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. Now, of course, he talks about the um, false Christ that would come uh, so that they would not be deceived. He talked about nations rising against nation, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes, all of those things found in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy chapter 32, which foretold and foreshadowed Israel's uh, last days. But he said all of those things were the beginning of sorrows and the end was not yet. Um, he talked about them being delivered up to the councils, things that we can see in the book of Acts when they go before kings and uh, etc., such as before uh, Fest and governors, etc., Festus and Felix, Felix, uh, Herod and uh, Agrippa. And it says that many false prophets would uh, rise up and deceive many and because of lawlessness which would abound, the love of many would grow cold. But now here's a statement where we want to focus on. In verse uh, 13 and 14, but particularly verse 14, it says, but he who endures to the end. In other words, the person living in that time who would endure through those things to the end, 
the Bible says he would be saved. And so in verse 14, and this is the key point, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the inhabited earth. That's what that phrase in all the world means when you look it up in the Greek. As a witness to all the nations, and then the end would come. So the Lord says, when the gospel had been published to all the inhabited earth as a witness to all the nations, then the end would come. However, what he does, as we read through the chapter, and by the time we get down to verse 34, he makes this statement. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. He didn't separate this from, uh, you know, one verse from the other, this event from the other, and say that, okay, all of these things are going to happen in this generation, but here are a few that we want to cherry pick out of the context and say it's going to happen in a future ge generation, namely in our future. No, that's not what he said. He spoke to the people in that generation. He was speaking to his apostles, and he was telling them what was going to happen in their generation, the very generation in which Jesus was living in uh, before he passed away. This is what he said. Now, let's look at some of the elements of the text that we want to compare with Acts chapter 17 and verses 30 and 31. Now, number one, the text tells us that the gospel of the kingdom would be preached. That's very clear because he says in this gospel of the kingdom will be preached. And we uh, see that he's talking about the gospel of the kingdom. Now, it was John the Immerser who announced that the kingdom of God was at hand. Matthew chapter 3 and the verse is 2. When he said, repent, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So did Christ in Matthew 4 and verse 17 when he went into the region of Galilee. And Mark chapter 1 verses 14 and 15 says um, that after John had been cast into prison, Jesus came into the region of Galilee and preached, saying, the time is fulfilled, uh, the kingdom of heaven has drawn near, repent and believe the gospel. So the message surrounding the kingdom was that, number one, the time for the kingdom to appear had come, and that was an appointed time. Secondly, he was saying that the um, kingdom had drawn near, so it was imminent, it was on the horizon, it was to be expected in the very near future. And he says, therefore, because of that, repent, change your ways, modify your behavior, put your life in order. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. And, uh, and this was the message. And then we have, even in Luke chapter 21 and verse 31, where he says, so likewise you, when you see all these things, know that the kingdom of God has drawn near. And once again, he says, assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Now, that being the case, we see that it was the gospel being preached. It was the announcement of the kingdom, which was at hand. And secondly, we have the statement that uh, the gospel was to be published throughout the whole inhabited earth. The phrase used there is the term orkumene. Uh, it was to go to the whole uh, inhabited earth, to all the earth. And I believe it may use the Greek word pasas there. Uh, but nevertheless, this is what we have, the inhabited earth, or Kimene. Now, that phrase is used in the first century to refer to the entirety of the Roman Empire. For example, it's used in Luke chapter 2 to speak of a census that was taken in the time of Augustus Caesar. It came to pass, according to Luke 2, verse 1, beginning, and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Now, notice this decree goes out from Caesar Augustus, watch, that all the world should be registered. So it's a census that was being taken. It was being taken in the Roman Empire, within the Roman Empire, under the reign of Augustus Caesar, and he says that all the inhabited earth would be taxed. That's the same way the term is being used in Matthew chapter 24 
and verse 14. And watch, it says, this census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. Verse 2. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. So that shows you that we're talking about the inhabited earth that was a part of the Roman Empire under the reign of Augustus Caesar, and that is the world that is being spoken of in Matthew 24, 14. Even though at the time uh, when John the Baptist came preaching and uh, when Jesus was preaching, it was during the reign of Tiberius Caesar because Augustus uh, had already uh, left the scene. Now, let's look at some other examples of this term and its use. In the 21st chapter of Luke and verse 26, in a chapter that is clearly referring to the events surrounding the destruction of the temple because it's parallel to Matthew chapter 24, he says that these things would be coming upon the Orchimene. Let me go to uh, Luke chapter 21 so that we actually read verse 26 for you so that you can see uh, what the text uh, actually says. It says, uh, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the land for the powers of the heavens uh, would be shaken. So in here, he says these things were coming on the orcumene. All right, so there is the term that's being used in that text. In verse 35, he says, for it will come as a snare on the face of the whole earth. Now there it uses the word, a different term, uh, which is the word for land, but it says these things would come upon the whole land. And then in Acts 28, here's a parallel to our text that we have in Matthew 24, 14 in terms of how the uh, actual uh, wording is structured. Uh, it talks about a famine. Remember Jesus predicted that these famines would come during that time leading up to the fall of Jerusalem, where here is Acts chapter 11, beginning at verse 28. It says, Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be or it was about to be a great famine throughout all the Orchomene, throughout all the world, which happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. So Claudius Caesar was the Caesar who succeeded Tiberius Caesar, and um, we have the fact of saying that this famine was going to take place in all the world, but it took place in the time of Claudius Caesar, who reigned after Tiberius. So again, that's showing you how they use the term orcumene within that particular time frame. Then we have our text that we want to talk about, and that is Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. So watch how this text reads. In verse 30, the Bible says, Truly, these times of ignorance God winked at, or overlooked. Now again, notice that he said, these times of ignorance. Uh, that God overlooked, but now, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the inhabited earth. There again is the same inhabited earth that's spoken of in Matthew 24, 14, that was spoken of in Luke 2 and verse 1, and in the other passages that we mentioned. So he will judge, or he is about to judge, literally, the inhabited earth in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Now, we have other references to this Orchumene in Acts 19.27. All Asia and the world worships uh, in Acts 24 and verse 5. We have the term throughout all the world in Hebrews 1.6. Uh, he brought Christ into the Orchumene into the world, but we have another phrase that is identical in Revelation 3 and verse 10. Let me read that particular verse in Revelation 3 and verse 10, speaking about this uh, orchimene. In verse 10, it says, because you have kept my command to persevere. Now, he's writing to the church in the first century, to the church at Philadelphia. And he says, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world. He literally says, 
I will keep you out of the hour of trial, which is about to come on the whole world, on all the orkumene, to test those who dwell on the earth or on the land. Now, this passage was written during the time of uh, the reign of Nero Caesar because we have historical documents that at least say that Nero, I mean that John was banished to the Isle of Patmos during the reign of Nero the emperor. We're not using that as conclusive evidence, but it is a historical document uh, from, you know, the 5th century, I believe, uh, on the title page of the Syriac version that says that. However, there's plenty of internal evidence in the book of Revelation that suggests that it was the reign of Nero when that book was written prior to 70 AD. But we're just showing you that. And so in Revelation uh, 12 and verse 9, we also have the whole orchumene where it talks about the devil deceives the whole world. That's the same phrase. And in Revelation 16 and verse 14, it talks about they're going out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world. So in those verses, all of them are using that term in the very same manner, and we should understand it as such. Now, the next thing that we want to point out is that the time was imminent. Uh, we've already alluded to that in the statement, but when we look at Matthew 24, 14, you can see the urgency. You can see the imminence, because this is what he said. This gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the inhabited, inhabited earth as a witness to all the nations, then the end would come. Before God would bring about the judgment upon Israel, he would publish his word throughout all the nations. In other words, he was not going to do anything unless he had first revealed it to, uh, to his uh, saints, to the people. So it's very important for us to understand that the gospel had to be published in order for the people to understand the gospel, but also to know that there was an impending judgment about to take place and how they could deliver themselves from it. So it occurred once again before that generation passed away, and the proof that the end would come is the preaching of the gospel to all the world. Now notice, there was a, a requirement, there was a demand that said this gospel of the kingdom must be preached as a witness to all the nations, and then the end would come. In all the inhabited earth, that it had to go as a witness to all the nations, then the end would come. Well, the apostles are very, very uh, emphatic that the gospel had been preached as a witness to all the world in their own generation in the first century. Let's take a look at that. Uh, Paul actually confirms it in several of the passages in uh, the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 5, let's notice he says, Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Now, Paul said that they had received grace and apostleship for what purpose? For obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Now, if we go to verses 7 and 8, he says, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world, throughout all the world. All right. And so there he says their faith had been spoken of throughout all the world. Then if we go to the 10th chapter of the epistle to the Romans, Paul says this, and he uses the very same term that is used in uh, Matthew 24 and verse 14. He says, But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the uh, land, or the earth, and their words to the ends of the orchumene, to the ends of the inhabited earth. So he's telling you that as early as the late 50s to early 60s, that the gospel had gone to the ends of the orcumene, and therefore showing you that this gospel had been preached as a witness to all the nations. But let's go further to Romans, the 16th chapter, verses 25 and 26. The Bible says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel, 
and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the age began, but now made manifest. Notice, but now made manifest. That means revealed. That means published. And by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. And then our last couple of passages are found in Colossians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, where uh, the text tells us concerning the gospel having gone to all the world. Again, he says, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you, so it had come to the Colossians, just like he had said it had come to the Romans, which has come to you as it has in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. And our last text that we have time for is Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23. Paul said, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. So he confirms and affirms that the gospel had been gone to all had gone to all the world in their own generation in the first century. But what was the point? He says, when this gospel has been preached to all the world in all the nations, then the end would come. Now that shows the eminence. That's all the time that we have for the broadcast today. And so we will pick up on part two of this lesson of comparing Matthew 24 with Acts 17, 30 and 31 to show that they're dealing with the same time and generation and therefore that the judgment of Acts 17, 30 was fulfilled in connection with the judgment of Matthew 25 or 24 and verse 14. I want to thank you for watching. I'm William Bell. We'll see you on next week, same time for another study of the Word of God. Before we go, we'd like to ask you to pick up a copy of our book called Shipwreck Faith, Deuteronomy 28. This book discusses the transatlantic slave trade verses AD 70 from Deuteronomy 28. You can pick it up at our website at allthingsfulfilled.com or at amazon.com.